the Jeep Wrangler 4xe. It's electrified. Boogie, woogie, woogie. So you can boogie, woogie, woogie up a mountain, boogie. over creeks, or boogie, woogie, woogie through a desert where you get bit by a pit viper. So you boogie, woogie, woogie back to camp and ask your friends if they'll suck the snake venom out. When they say no, you boogie, woogie, woogie to the nearest hospital for a dose of anti-venom and boogie, woogie, woogie your way to a full recovery. The electrified Jeep Wrangler 4xe. Learn more at jeep.com. Jeep is a registered trademark of FCA US LLC. Pros know a thing or two about how to get the toughest messes clean. That's why they've long trusted cleaning products from Ecolab for their businesses. And now, that level of clean is available for your home at The Home Depot. Introducing Ecolab Scientific Clean, a full line of pro-grade cleaning products for all your home's needs. So you can clean like you mean business. Now available exclusively at The Home Depot. How doers get more done. On this episode of History Worth Saving, we continue our discussion with teachers. Teachers from all over America who are doing incredible things. We go today to Kentucky, to rural Kentucky, where kids are building airplanes. And you heard me right. Kids are building airplanes that actually fly with people on board. And the guy who makes it all happen, my good friend Nathan Hammond, is in studio. And he's joining me right now. Nathan, thanks for coming on. History Worth Saving. Thanks for having me, Matt. I was thinking about who I wanted on this show. And everybody has that one teacher that has just left such an indelible mark on their life uh, that they can't go back and imagine their life without them. And I think you're that guy for a lot of these kids up there in Kentucky because you're bringing them out into a new world that many of them would never be exposed to. Because you and I are both, we, we, we're both pilots, we're both friends from the air show world. And I was thinking, you know, there are so many people that have no idea uh, that anything like this is possible because we think of aviation in America right now in terms of a big fence around a piece of land that has a runway on it and nobody knows what goes on behind that fence. And you're bringing kids to the other side of it. Not only that, but you're teaching them to build an airplane, which is just, to me, that's unfathomable for most of the American public. Well, that was the genesis of the program was we wanted to get people through that fence, through the gate, onto the airport. And, uh, and let them realize what a big world aerospace was in general. And, and it's one of the largest exports in Kentucky. It is. It is. Yeah, it, it used to be crops, and nowadays it's, it's aerospace. Um, we have UPS located there and Amazon now. And so all the sub-industries that support the big industries, uh, you know, by maintaining, by designing, by engineering, uh, by flying and controlling. So it is a it is a massive industry that is hidden in plain sight. I like that. Yeah, and you're talking about sub-industries that require people to uh, have a working knowledge of this, and you're giving these kids, these high school kids, uh, this working knowledge. Let's talk a little bit about the day-to-day -day program, and then I want to get into some other specifics because this day-to-day -day program for this thing, it's funded by a, a foundation uh, that is up there in your hometown. Yeah, so so the Sunflower Foundation realized that that this was a great opportunity for uh, for high school students to come out and and realize that there is more to the world. Um, so they funded this program and allowed us to to purchase a a, a Cupcrafters Carbon Cup kit. And so it's a it's a evolution of the J three Cup, right? It's yeah, the most the most common airplane in America, the most recognizable today. Yep. A yep. little yellow Piper Cub, but this thing is not your granddad's Piper Cub. Well, it, it's not. No, it's no. It, it's got the latest and greatest yeah. uh, avionics and whatnot. Um, it is certainly the the latest evolution of the airplane. This is like a three or four hundred thousand dollar airplane. When it's all said and done, yeah, they're they're up there, and uh, and kids are building, and it. kids are building it, and that's that's the great part. We've got thirty <laughs> kids that that come out to the airport, so it's it's a it's a program that is based at the Bardstown, Kentucky airport, and. Uh, and we bring the kids out uh, for three classes a day uh, for the entire season, for the entire school year. Right? It's it's not just hey come out once a week kind of deal. It it's almost a, a job for them. And so we we look at it kind of funny. Um, I'm not interested so much that they learn how to build an airplane. It's more we want them first off to use this as a gateway as a as a big giant door that we open 
so that they can see what else is out there in the world, but also so that they can start developing some work ethic. Um, you know, some of them will have jobs, you know, after, after school jobs and whatnot, but, but we can instill in them a work ethic that they understand has consequences. If they mess something up on the airplane, there are lives at stake. And, and to watch them blossom and, and grow the understanding that, hey, this has to be perfect. Um, we make it a point, we, we never get upset if there's a mistake. In fact, I won't say we encourage it, but we want them to understand that, hey, you know, every day is there's just another problem on the workbench that we have to solve. And it's how you, how you work through that problem that gets you on to the next, the next day and the next problem. And then eventually the punch list gets smaller and smaller. And these, these students, 17, 18 years old, have gone from 5,000 different parts and boxes to a working flying airplane that is sold off into the wild. And then better funds the program. And so, yeah, we, we, take, we take the airplane, we build the airplane, and then, uh, well, I'll back up. You, you know, we, we have the kit that arrives in June, July, and then August 1st, first day of school, whatever it is, that's when we, we open the kit and it starts with, I mean, day one, Yeah, they start inventorying the, the, the kit. And then we go through shop safety and, and basic tool knowledge and understanding how things work. And then over the next uh, 180 days of school, we, uh, we build this airplane. And so that by June 1st, the last day of school, the airplane has has been completed, been signed off by the FAA, and uh, and hopefully been sold. And so, uh, uh, one of the one of the quirks with with home built airplanes, like what we're doing, is you have to fly forty hours off for it to be considered airworthy. Um, and uh, and we try and start working on that um, during the end of school there. So and you're working on that right now, I guess. Uh, we're recording this in July, so it, it's done. Yeah, yeah. So, so the airplane's done. We we finished it up um, about a month before the end of school this year. Wow. And uh, and that gave us time to, to kind of spool down. We actually got the the next kid in a little bit early, and uh, and started prepping and getting ready for the next day, the, the next year of school. And so, uh, you know, the the prices vary, but but we're able to to fund the next year's kit from the previous year's. Uh, proceeds from the airplane and we also end up with uh, with some extra extra funds and we roll that into a secondary program mm. where we take another 10 12 students and we we get them up all the way to solo so we have a flight program as well you know and, and you don't hear about that anymore because you know you used to hear about flight programs and, and scholarship programs there's a few of them out there um that i can think of just off the top of my head but i mean this is something that is really possible now uh, for kids in Kentucky, uh, in rural Kentucky, because you're not living around a huge city. You live on the outskirts of one, but uh, uh, this is a great thing. I want to talk about teaching failure. We don't talk about that a lot, but you mentioned it um, when you said that, you know, sometimes you encourage kids to make a mistake. Today, we live in this almost sanitized completely unrealistic in my opinion uh, world where it's it's so dependent on test taking it is so dependent on you have got to do this and meet this metric in school and we really don't teach kids how to fail yeah and, and if you're in business you're failing forward continuously right i mean or aerobatics like we'll talk a little bit about that or sports uh, sports some to some degree, but again, it, you're you're always driving toward that win, and you're hinting that uh, the big aha moment is that there might be uh, knowledge and a whole lot of benefit in some early failures. Yeah, and and you can watch it because um, the students nowadays they all strive for perfection, and and that's 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 great, that's admirable. Um, I mean, that's what we want, you know, be, aim high. And, uh, but then, but then what we find we have to, we have to tweak, we have to, you know, massage is that when, when there's a, a mistake, um, you know, you, you drill a piece of plexiglass wrong, you, you, you rivet two pieces of metal together and it's, it's not quite right. Um, we teach them to, to self-evaluate 
and then then they have to to ask themselves is this acceptable and and so it gives them a little bit of of, of inward looking at their own skill set and so, and then and a lot of them will say you know I, I just don't like it We've, we'll have students that'll come up and say you know here I did this uh, you know I put A to B like it says in the book but I, I don't like it mm. and and that's that that's that little spark moment where you realize okay the student now understands hey it's 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 good but it's not great it's not where the student wants it to be and so you know, it's easy for them to, to either just push it under the table and be like, oh, yeah, that's good enough. Um, but when they realize, hey, you know, you're not going to get in trouble for, for making a mistake. And and nobody's going to yell at you. And, okay, let's let's fix our mistake. Let's just keep keep going forward. Like we say, you know, it's it's written on the board. You know, every day is just a, another set of problems. They're not. It's the how do you eat an elephant, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah, you did one piece at a time. And this is overwhelming. When you walk in there that first day and you go, my God. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it, there's it, just stuff everywhere. It, it's a culture shock for them um, because we're lucky enough that, that a couple of the airplanes now that we have finished actually stayed in-house. They, mm. uh, they were they were purchased by local people. So they can actually see the airplane. They can see what they're, what they're building. And they, and they can look out there and physically touch something that last year's students built. And so that helps, you know, bring it, bring it in close, uh, make it real for them that, that, hey, you know, they did it, so, so we should be able to do it. I remember as a kid, we'd get the box, the model airplane kit would come in, and I'd, you know, you'd, you'd open the box up and you'd, you'd pull all of the, I mean, it was just like a lumber yard. You'd pull it out, and you'd you'd have this moment where you'd go, "Oh, it's too much." What do I do? Yeah, yeah, it's it's. Over. What do I? What do I do? It's, and so to have you in the room and to be able to roll out the plans and say, "All right, the first thing we're going to do is we're not going to worry about any of the building skills. First thing we're going to do is just count everything and make sure we got everything." Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there's a process to this, uh, a complicated set of problems, and you solve it one problem one day. And you just keep going. And you just keep going. Like like you said, it's it's eating an elephant. So you just is one about at a time and and pace yourself. And uh, and so within a year, we're able to build an airplane out of that. The World War II generation had the ability, I think, um, to just the kids even who you know in the '30s and the '20s, they would get those model airplane kits or whatever it was. They they'd buy the Popular Science magazine, and they had the ability to read and comprehend something. Spatially, maybe. Maybe that's the difference. I don't know what it is, but they could read that stuff and they could build the transistor radio. They could build the model airplane kit. The women, you know, if they were interested in certain things, they, they could they could make the dress. They could, they just, they had a knowledge, it seems like, that was just innate. And I, and I don't know what that is. Uh, maybe it was passed down from generation to generation, but a lot of them, you talk about how they, you know, how did you learn how to do that? Well, I read a book. And, and you know, it's funny, you, you, you touch on that because. And I'm not saying that one is better than the other. No. But I'm wondering but, but how, how that happens. And, and, I, and I don't know. Um, I, I don't know what has changed because that's, that's kind of one of, our, one of our big hurdles in this program is getting the students to, to pick up the manual and be able to, to correspond what's in the manual versus what what the parts are laying on the table and and how this all works together which is funny because i can ask them how to program a website and it almost all of them just immediately are able to to mm. just say how it happens so i don't know if the if just the the learning skills and the skill set that they naturally come by have changed over the years whereas you know our fathers our grandfathers grandmothers, grandmother, uh, mothers and grandmothers just intuitively knew how to, to read something and correlate it right into, uh, right into whatever they were, you know, model airplanes, for example, you know, they could, they could look at, we think about the, the stick tissue models. Right? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. And, right. And, and, and there weren't, there weren't instructions. Right. There, you, there was just a plan. You, sheet. you had a, you had a blueprint and right. you had a stack of lumber and, right. and you had to, 
you had to understand, okay, well, I need to save this, this, this stick over here because this is kind of an important one. I only have one of them. So that's probably the spar set for the wings. I shouldn't cut that up and strip it down into little pieces. And, uh, and I don't know. But you do have to cut it, right? You got to lay it out on the plan. If, you got to, you got to cut eventually, it. Eventually, yeah, yeah. That's what always amazes me. And is 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 these folks had this ability just to to see something and to work with it in a in a way that it, it's beautiful to watch. If you if if you know somebody uh, who has that skill set, and so that's where I was going with this. I I think it's wonderful that they have you as the river guide, right? You're right on the back of the boat there, teaching them how to paddle. And that has to be comforting. But at some point, as an educator, you want to see them you want to see them start making the cuts by themselves. And at wh- what point does that happen? At what point do they get that confidence? So so with each student it's different, but but we'll see that ab- about halfway through the through the class. And um uh, and you'll just you'll ju- you'll just look over and, and typically what we do in the class is we'll we'll write all the days task on the board, right? I, I'd like to see this stuff done, okay? Pick a task, go to it, right? Uh, because we'll have 12, 15 different items going at, at any certain time. And in the beginning, first half of the year, first semester, generally the first thing they'll do is they'll they'll come up to you and they'll say, okay, well, how do I do this? <laughs> they, right. They're, how do I do this? They're, right. they're looking for the easy answer, right? Which is just somebody tell me. And and I understand that. They're They're they grow up in a in a world that is fast and efficient, right? We want solutions now, immediately, and so they understand intuitively that the fastest solution is just to ask the boss, ask the teacher. Well, how do I do this? Well, okay, well, look it up on YouTube, <laughs> and 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 they get tired of it because my first answer will be, well, look in the manual. You know, it probably says it somewhere in the manual if you can find it in the manual, and so. So they learn real quick that that I'm I'm not going to be the easy button for them, and and once they get past that that mindset of okay, well I have to I have to find my own solutions, then then that light clicks and and they start remembering where things are in the book. They, they can't quote the the manual verbatim by any means, but they know hey you know I was I was flipping through looking for something two weeks ago and I remember seeing something about the control linkage and that's what I'm working on right now. So, so maybe I'll, I'll flip through that book real quick and I'll, and they'll find something and then that'll lead them to another, to another, to another. And, and that's the skill set that we're, that we're trying to really hammer into them is, you know, I don't care if you're building an airplane. I don't care if, if we're, we're working on fabric or, or building a motor or something like that. It's the skill set of when you, when you come up to a challenge not to just throw your hands up in the air and say, "Oh well, you know, I can't do it," you know, or or somebody else will come along and do it for me. It's they they have to press forward and find a solution, and that's that's what we're going for. And you'll start to see that little that little spark moment, and and then it snowballs because they they do it once. They go, "Oh hey, I, I figured this out. I figured it out on my own. Oh, I don't have to waste time and just sit around because because even a you know, a student, even if they don't, they're not a hundred percent committed. And, and we have those students, right? They're, they're, they're there because they didn't want to be in algebra two. I get that. Um, but even those students will, will realize, Oh wait, this is kind of fun when, when I can come up with my own solutions and, and be able to, to pace this work and, and be able to mark stuff off the board, a completion. And, and that's where, that's when, when myself, the instructor, that's when I have that moment of, okay, he's, he's getting, she's getting it. And, and at that point, now I'm, now I'm not concerned anymore. How do you, uh, how do you measure success? Um, cliche, but, but by the failures. Um, uh, yeah. Um, when a, with this, in the case of the students, when, when a student messes up, um, so these cubs, they're they're covered with fabric. Um, most of your listeners probably understand that. Um, it's a it's a it's a cloth that we that we glue down to the the structure, and then we shrink it with heat, and then we we start spraying coats of paint on it, right? And one of the things you have to do is to make a really nice looking airplane is you have to sand on it a lot. Okay, you, you think about an old car, you know, you have to sand mm-hmm. the paint, 
block it down smooth. We have to do the same thing, Mr. With, Miyagi. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, and and so my poor students this year, they they, uh, uh, I think that was the bane of their existence was right. was sanding the paint because you have to be very careful if if you're in an open bay where there's there's no structure underneath. It's right. just the open area. You can you can press on it pretty hard and nothing bad will happen when you're sanding. But if you if you accidentally go over a piece of structure, a piece of tubing, a rib or whatnot, uh, it takes about three passes right. with, with a piece of sandpaper, and you've you've cut through the fabric. That's that's how delicate this is, and uh, and so we had a couple of students that, uh, you know, and, and you can't blame you can't you can't get mad at them, right? Because we're doing monotonous work for hours on end, days on end, weeks on end of of sanding down all this paint to make it nice and smooth. And and they'll have just a moment of, of lax attention and accidentally go over top of the structure. And then all of a sudden we've got a hole in the fabric, right, which is bad. Yeah, because then, you, then you've got to do something well, with then, it. Then we got to start all over again yeah. and, and with a, a repair. And uh, and so we had a couple of students that, that accidentally uh, cut through the fabric. And and so, you know, that's a, that's, that's a, really, that's a really bad mistake, okay? But we don't get mad, and and watching them come up and say, "Hey, we we messed up. Um, we think we know how to fix this. We want to tell you how we're going to fix this, and then you tell us if that's correct." And at that point, I I, I could have yeah. left for the day because I was so happy, right? Uh, not you know not because of the mistake, but but here they are. They they've already formulated a plan of how to how to fall forward, right? And okay, we messed up. And it happens. Um, it wasn't malicious by any stand, and and now they're figuring out how to fix this. And, and I said, okay, you, I like your plan. I like your idea. Let's press forward. And by the end of the next day, they had the the, the repair done, and nobody but myself and them know where that that mistake is on the airline. And that's somebody that's hireable. I mean, at, right out of high school at that point, that's somebody that has the skill set, and more importantly, the the work ethic. Uh, to move forward and and that was you know you, you look at the goal sheet of the program and and that's that's number one is, is we wanted students 17 18 years old to be able to graduate high school and immediately be able to go into the workforce and it didn't matter if it was aerospace or not they could go anywhere they wanted we're talking to nathan hammond who's an instructor in kentucky teaching kids how to build airplanes. And Nathan uh, grew up up there in uh, New York, in old Rhinebeck, which is a historic field of dreams where they fly airplanes that don't have instruction manuals because most of them were lost uh, back in the early 1900s, like World War I type airplanes where just nobody is alive to remember how to do this stuff. And we've been talking about it instruction manuals and how you build this stuff and in, in your childhood there there really was uh there really was nobody to guide you through this other than the old men and women who worked around uh, these old airplanes at the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome and I'm guessing that some of that knowledge of of working on old things uh has carried over into this but how How did you first fall in love with this stuff? Because this is the part of the show where I like to turn the tables just a little bit and say, who is this guy, this Nathan Hammond guy? And where did he come from? Because they don't teach this stuff anymore. So I was lucky. Um, I was born and raised in Rhinebeck, New York, home of old Rhinebeck Aerodrome. And and the Aerodrome was was my playground, um, was, was my incubator for life. Um, by age 10, running around on the field there, I could tell you all about, uh, uh Louis Blario, um, the Curtis Jenny, um, Lindbergh, all these greats of aviation. And, uh, I couldn't tell you a thing about sports ball and yeah. I still can't talk about sports ball, right? And right. baseball, basketball, it, yeah. it, it just, it, 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 I missed that gene, but old Rhinebeck what is, uh, just this magical place where where old airplanes still fly, and and so that's where I grew up with. And a man named Cole Palin was the one that started and ran that for years and years and years. And he was he, he had the forethought, the foresight 
to to gather up all of the all the World War One pilots through the fifties and sixties and and people of World War One, and and just sit down and talk with them, and and get that tribal knowledge, the knowledge that that you don't see in the books, the the knowledge that just gets lost over time. He was able to collect as much of that as he could, so that he could he could keep these airplanes flying. And so up there at Old Rhinebeck, we, we had a an original Curtis Jenny, you know, with a 150 horse Hisso engine on it. And you just don't see those engines anymore. And you don't see those airplanes anymore. And and on top of that, he he had a a, a triplane and a sop with camel and all of these these World One airplanes. And he had you know pioneers, the, the the very first airplanes in the world. You know, basically a kite. You know, something that that makes our our modern day ultralights look like a Cadillac, right? Right. And, you know, you, you've right. got, you've got a, a, a Blario, uh, that goes all of maybe 25 miles an hour. Maybe, um, it doesn't even have ailerons. It just, the, the, you have to warp the wings and, and how do you, how do you keep that airplane flying? How do you keep the engines on these old airplanes running? How do you keep a rotary engine going? And so he gathered up all that information and, and all that tribal knowledge. And then the, the best part about it was he invited everybody out there. And he brought them in, and and you could, you could be a kid, you could be an adult, didn't matter. And if you showed just the the slightest bit of of knowledge of, uh, or the the slightest bit of, of interest, hey, come on this side of the fence. Hey, come on over here. Hey, why don't you come help us? You know, get this airplane running. Hey, why don't you help us cover this wing real quick? And so as a as a kid, I was I was one of those lucky ones that that got to run around and and play with all this stuff, and. Uh, and yeah. soak it up and learn. Oh, oh it'd be a sponge. You know, we, we talk about eyes and ears, open mouth shut. Just, just soak, just soak it all up that we can. And then, if you have to ask questions later, to, to fill in the holes. And uh, and so that's where that's where I got my start was was playing with all these old airplanes. And uh, and then we, we ended up you know life changes, and so we moved to Central Kentucky uh, to be closer to family. And and that that spark of of old airplanes of old Rhinebeck. Um, it just became a raging fire. And, and so that's all I wanted to do was airplanes, old airplanes, uh, loved old airplanes and went to college, realized, you know, Hey, old airplanes are great. Um, that's kind of, it's a very small niche market. Um, so, so let's, let's broaden our chances of, of a career. So I went to college and, uh, I got an aviation administration degree so that I could, I could run an airport mm-hmm. and, um, uh, and coming out of, of college, I, I met a, a man named Ron Alexander uh, just by passing, and and it's funny how in aviation we we go full full circle, right? Right. Uh, it's, right. It's amazing how many times you'll you'll make a lap around, and, and so strike up a conversation with Ron. He says, "Yeah, you know, I'm I'm helping this museum up in New York. I'm looking for a guy that that knows how to work on old airplanes." I said, "Oh, you know, you know I, I know a little bit about old airplanes. You know, I, I might be able to help you." And we talk a little bit more, and and. So I go down there to the shop, look around, see what's going on, and it's the airplanes of old Ryan Big Air Drum. Yeah. Uh, so right. so he he was helping the museum by bringing the airplanes down and rebuilding them, and then sending them back up. And uh, and so I, I I told him the rest of the story of you know who I was, where I, where I came from, and and so then for the next ten years uh, out of Georgia, I was I was working on old airplanes again, and and just you know it was it was a love of of everything old airplanes. You and I met in the air show world because you've become. Really, the 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 number one guy for sky riding and for night air shows. I mean, your night air show. When you think about a night air show, I, I mean, that alone just sounds scary. Like, what in the world they do this at night? But you have a Fourth of July fireworks display that is on your airplane when you take off, and you fire these rockets and and just all kind of crazy stuff off your airplane in the middle of the night. And it's, it is spectacular and it's called ghost rider air shows. Uh, you can find it uh, online. We'll click link it into the show story. But uh, in the last few minutes, that is nuts. It's, it's spectacularly crazy. It's the most braggadocious American in your face, rock and roll air show I've ever seen. And it, and it, it's just incredible. Well, it's, it's fun. And, and, you know, I don't want to sound like a record, but it's, it's those older airplanes again, right? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, I, I fly yeah. to Havilland Chipmunk, uh, similar to the airplane that, that you fly around. And, uh, 
And this one has been has been tweaked a little bit. This one has really been tweaked, Nathan. This is a hot <laughs> rod, and it's got LED. How many LEDs are on there? We got about three thousand LED LEDs on yeah. the airplane. Um, yeah, so so it's a great airplane, right? A flashy paint job, but but in the end of the day, uh, it loops and it rolls. And and so in the air show world, you you have to be able to to entertain the crowd, right. um, and and be able to to tell a story, whatever your story is, be it just a good time or or maybe a history lesson. Um, and so I wanted to just sell a good time. You know, hey, come on out to the airplane. Uh, come out to the airport. Look at airplanes. Airplanes are awesome. Um, come join us. Come have fun with us. That's that's, that's the story that I I was trying to tell. And and so we had to figure out how to be entertaining with an airplane, right? Right. And, and why not rockets? And, why not? And so explosives are always fun. <laughs> and and so we we built up some mounts that that go on the the wingtips. Right. And we load about 200 pounds of pyro on the airplane and takes us so oh, six to eight hours to load all that stuff and then four minutes to, to blow it up. Yeah. And it's spectacular. You got to go find Ghost Rider, like you're writing uh, something, ghostwriterairshows.com. And it's ghostwriterairshows.com. That's it? it. Yeah. And check out Nathan Hammond uh, on there. You know, your stuff, everybody that posts videos of you on YouTube doing that routine. One of the things I've noticed is that you never hear the music because usually they're far back. They're somewhere else. It's the cra- It's always the crowd perspective. And it, it, all you hear are people interacting and doing exactly what you just said you wanted them to do. Uh, come to the airport and have a good time. And they're drawn in by this performance. So job well done, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I'm ready to go see this carbon cub that these kids have built. Let's and, go do it. And... I'm telling you, that's that's pretty awesome. I'd love to go see one. I really would. I'd love to get up there and then see one. You're going to Air Venture, uh, which is the largest aviation family gathering in the world uh, next weekend. So good luck up there. Thanks, Matt. Nathan Hammond, everybody. Find more at historyworthsaving.com, where you can, of course, uh, subscribe to our newsletter. You can uh, see what's going on and never miss a minute of action on History Worth Saving. This is uh, Season 5, Celebrating Teachers. My thanks again to Nathan Hammond for coming on, and my thanks to you for being here. So long for now.